So folks, what we're going to talk about is the upper limb ultrasound MSK intervention. So I'm gonna start with the shoulder joint all the way down to the fingertip. Okay, so that's what we're gonna to cover today. Now, these are my disclosures. As I would say, I'm a certified interventional pain sonologist. I'm a fellow of interventional pain practice from Wellness to Pain. I founded Leicester Pain Education when I started as a consultant back in 2015. It's very active educational society. We run various conferences and courses, including cadaver courses. I'm a founder of Pain Talks and Pain Flicks, editor of Nysora Ultrasound Pain App. I work as an examiner for the FIPP and CIPS exam. And the reason I got involved into the education because I work as a lead for clinical lead for ePain, which is the largest educational platform in the UK run by Faculty of Pain Medicine, Royal College of Anesthetists. So this is the Leicester Pain Education logo, Pain Talks, which you're currently attending. As I said, we have a huge amount of fan following on the, on the Pain Talks. We have a YouTube channel as well as Facebook page. Pain Flicks, I already told you about. The website is called blockit.club. Uh, ultrasound Pain App, you can check on Nysora's website uh, or the App Store. So let's start with shoulder. Now, what kind of interventions we're going to talk about in shoulder joint is the acromioclavicular joint, long head of bicep peritendinous sheet injection, subacromial subdeltoid bursa, glenohumeral joint, suprascapular axillary nerve block, and I've also included the updates on shoulder joint denervation. And we're going to talk about radio frequency, both pulse radio frequency, as well as the conventional radio frequency. So let's begin. Now, acromioclavicular joint, majority of the patients who present with this pain of the acromioclavicular joint will tell you with, your, with their finger saying, doctor, it hurts here in the anterior part of the shoulder. Now, how do we diagnose this condition? The way you would diagnose it, you would actually examine them, ask them to touch the contralateral shoulder. It's called a scarf side. It's like putting on the scarf. If they have a pain in the acromioclavicular joint on palpation and also was touching the contralateral shoulder, most likely they have acromioclavicular joint osteoarthritis. You can then do an x-ray to confirm it. Even ultrasound can also confirm that there is an osteoarthritis of the acromioclavicular joint. Now, this is just the anatomy, the clavicle, acromion. You have a joint capsule, which is a superior and inferior joint capsule. And below the inferior joint capsule, you have a supraspinatus muscle. Now, people have been doing this injection of acromioclavicular joint blindly. But unfortunately, there is no guarantee if you do it blindly, you won't know whether you've actually injected in the joint or have you injected in the supraspinatus muscle. And that's where the role of ultrasound comes into the play. Here we are using ultrasound, a high frequency linear probe and looking at the clavicle and acromion. And you can nicely see the superior capsule of the acromioclavicular joint. You can see the supraspinatus muscle and you see this small black area. This is actually your subacromial subdeltoid bursa. So if you use blind technique or an anatomical landmark technique, there's no surety that you are injecting the joint. You may be injecting either in the bursa or in the supraspinatus muscle. So the only way to know that you've injected in the joint is to use the image guidance, which will make your procedure very accurate. Okay, the accuracy is about 100% with using ultrasound for acromioclavicular joint injection. Now I'm gonna show you a few videos. This is the pain and MSK sonology video manual, which I already mentioned from blockit.club. So this is the acromioclavicular joint injection demo video, which will show you how do we scan this. And then I'll also show you the video on the bicep tendon. And then, you know, if you guys are interested to look at the other videos, we have covered everything, cervical spine, lumbar spine. I'm gonna show you a few videos for you guys to know how ultrasound is useful to identify all these MSK structures and target them accurately. Okay, here you go. I'm going to show you how to perform the ultrasound guided promoclavical joint injection in three easy steps. The stepwise approach is very important. We're going to teach you the steps in the form of position, palpation, and scan. Position of the patient, the patient will be in the sitting position with the arm uh, supine. So this is a neutral position. This is the position that's been used for majority of the ultrasound guided scanning and ultrasound guided procedures. The second step is basically feel for the clavicle. And once you feel for the clavicle, and then also feel for the acromion, and where you have the junction of the acromion and the clavicle is your acromioclavicular joint. Then you will put your probe on the top 
of the acromioclavicular joint. And as you can see on the screen, the acromioclavicular joint has been highlighted. And freeze the image from it, please. Now I'm going to show you with the arrow uh, about the acromioclavicular joints. That's the clavicular end. That's the acromial end. Uh, uh, sorry, that's the acromial end. That's the clavicular end. We have got the acromioclavicular joint capsule and the muscle that you see deeper here, the supraspinatus muscle. We have bursa on the top. Here is the subacromial subacromial bursa. Now the injection technique. You will can perform this procedure by a gel standoff technique where you can put a lot of gel and you can bring the needle through the gel uh, with an implant technique. Or the other option would be to put the ultrasound probe and perform the injection out of plane and the needle will come out of plane into the capsule. So make sure that the depth here is one and a half centimeters. At one centimeter, you'll be in the joint. If you go anything deeper, you will end up going into the subacromial, supraspinal tendon and may inject into the bursa. So this is the reason I think using the ultrasound is paramount in part importance because you can actually scan the superficial structure like a chromoglobal right precisely and you can target the joint precisely. Thank you. Okay, so that's the that's the acromioclavicular joint injection. Let me now move on to the next structure. The next structure is a long head of biceps. Now, this is another structure that's in the anterior part of the shoulder. And patients who come to you would say, you know what, doctor, it hurts when I actually try and lift my arm up. And you always ask them to do it, what we call an empty can test. So, you know, you will try and find if they have a tendon tenderness over the bicep tendon. And it's a long head of biceps we're talking about. There's also a short head, but the long head of the biceps becomes intra-articular, uh, you know, and the upper part of the shoulder joint, and we can easily scan this. So ultrasound is a very useful tool to actually diagnose as well as treat. You can diagnose the rupture, the subluxation, the dislocation. So ultrasound is like a stethoscope for any MSK problem. You basically put the ultrasound probe, you ask the patient to move the shoulder, you can you know, move the muscle, you can find out if there's a subluxation or dislocation of the long head of the biceps. So how would we scan it? You can scan it longitudinally or you can scan it transversely. And this is basically the long head of bicep, as you could see, that's actually becomes intra-articular in the upper part of the humerus. So this is what you would do when you put the transverse scanning, you will get a greater tuberosity and lesser tuberosity. You'll have a, the deltoid muscle, that's basically a superficial muscle. And this is the long head of biceps. Now, this is a very unisotropic structure. What I mean by unisotropy, when your ultrasound is going perpendicular to the, pro, to the bicep tendon, it's bright. But if it's not perpendicular, it will look dark. So it's very important to scan this tendon, both in the transverse view, as well as in the longitudinal view. As we do with the x-rays, one view is no view, always use ultrasound in both views. If you suspect a pathology, and if you're diagnosing a pathology, always scan it in the transverse view, as well as longitudinal view. And this is the intra-articular portion of the bicep tendon and what we call this as a rotator cuff interval. So you start scanning here and move up. And when you move up, you're gonna basically see the bicep tendon becoming intra-articular. You have a supraspinatus tendon, a supraspinatus muscle, you have subscapularis muscle, and between the two, you have the tendon of the bicep muscle. Now, how do we inject the, we don't inject the tendon, we inject the te tendon sheath. So the tendon is surrounded by a sheath. When you have a tendinitis, you want to inject the sheath to minimize the inflammation. This is a longitudinal section of the bicep tendon showing you basically a sheath on the top and that's the tendon. So we always scan the muscle in the transverse view as well as longitudinal view. Always put the color Doppler. It's very important and I'll show you in a video in a minute. It's very important to look for this small artery, which is the anterior circumflex humeral artery branch. It's very important because what you don't want to do is to actually inject into this artery. So how would you inject this uh, tendon? You can do in-plane technique uh, coming from medial to lateral and injecting in the tendon sheath. So this is basically just showing you the needle and the tendon is, is there. You don't want, and you know, it's not easy to inject in the tendon. When you try to inject in the tendon, you will find there's a lot of resistance. So try to use five cc syringe, few tips, any MSK injections you want to do. And if you want to minimize having osteoarthritis of your own MT, MCP joint, use a bigger syringe because smaller syringe create a lot of pressure 
Don't use two cc syringe, use five cc or 10 cc syringe. Use a 25 gauge needle and basically gentle injection. Uh, if you encounter a lot of pressure, then you know you're actually in the tendon. So this is a quick video. This is a second video showing the bicep tendon, and then we will move on to the, to the rest of the structures. So I'm going to show you the uh, ultrasound guided bicep uh, peritendinous injection. Now to do, perform this procedure, the steps are position the patient in the neutral position with the arm, so sort of forearm supine, and you will be basically palpating the area. This is the upper part of the head of the humerus. This is where the vesicular groove is. And the third step we're going to do is we're going to put the ultrasound probe and uh, we're going to make sure that we are actually, so let me just take some gel. So the left side of the screen is lateral, the right side of the screen is medial, and you could uh, nicely see the bicep tendon there. And I'm going to ask you to freeze the image. So to show you the procedure, the, the structures in this image, you have the greater tuberosity, you have the lesser tuberosity, you have bicep tendon sitting in the vesicular groove, and that's your transverse humeral ligament. And there's a small blood vessel there, that's the ascending branch of the circumflex humeral artery. And this is basically your structure of interest. And the injection you need to do is a peritendinous injection. So never inject steroids in the tendon. You know, given that you have an artery which is on the lateral side, I always recommend coming in plane from medial to lateral, bringing the needle below the sheath of the tendon uh, and then inject the local anesthetic steroid. Total volume will be one and a half ml, which will include half a cc of lignol pain and uh, uh, one cc of triangular or uh, depometry. So, just to recap, position sitting, palpate the upper part of the humerus then you will be basically uh, putting your ultrasound probe on the top of the upper part of the humerus at the vesicular groove. And now you can see the, the greater tuberosity, you've got the lesser tuberosity, and you've got uh, a lovely uh, artery there, that's the uh, circumflex, ascending branch of the circumflex humeral artery. Uh, if I ask you to put the Doppler, please, there's a Doppler button, uh, which is uh, D, uh, color Doppler. Let's put the color Doppler. So let's go back to D, and that's the color Doppler there. And I will do the blood vessel nicely seen there, and that's your ascending circle vestibular artery. And uh, let's go back. So that's how you would perform the uh, sub, you know, long head of bicep peritendinous sheath injection. Now move on to the next structure, which is a subacromal subdeltoid bursa. Now People always inject this bursa, but it's important to know why they have bursitis. Majority of the times you will find the bursa is inflamed or there's a bursitis because you have a supraspinatus uh, tendinitis. So it's very important that you actually look for the pathology. If you don't treat the pathology, just do the bursa injection, patient might not get good benefit. It's, it's good to inject the bursa, but you also need to diagnose why they have a bursitis. So it's the largest bursa in the body. It's located under the acromion process and the caracoacromial ligament. And the main reason the bursa is there is to minimize the cuff attrition. So when your shoulder moves through the arc, the bursa reduces the friction. So that's the whole reason the bursa is there. How would you do a bursa injection? You ask the patient to reach for the back pocket. We call this a modified cross position. So this is a neutral position. This is a modified cross position. Now, what is the difference between the two? When you do modified cross position, you bring on a lot of big portion of supraspinatus muscle from underneath the acromion out. So this is a neutral position. Look at the size of the supraspinatus muscle and look at the size of the supraspinatus muscle when you do modified cross position. So if your patient can reach for the back pocket, it's an ideal position to do the subacromial subdeltoid bursa injection. Having said that, if patient has a painful shoulder and if they can't do that, you can still inject the bursa very accurately. As you could see the black area here, is called as peribursal fat. And that's where the bursa is located. So you have a deltoid muscle, you have supraspinatus muscle. The bony bit here is the humerus. 
and you can bring the needle in plane and you can inject the bursa very precisely, very accurately. So just showing you how the needle is being positioned here in plane technique coming in and you can inject three to four cc's of 1% lidocaine. This is a schematic diagram showing you how the bursa is looking and you're putting the ultrasound probe and bringing the needle in plane. So that's subacromial subdeltoid bursa. Moving on to the next structure, which is a glenohumeral joint. Uh, so glenohumeral joint has a lot of outpouching. I told you the joint capsule extends all the way on the top of the uh, bicep tendon. So bicep tendon becomes intraarticular at the rotator cuff interval. And you also have pouching into the axilla. So a lot of times patients who have arthritis may present to you with the axillary swelling. Okay, so they can actually have an axillary swelling or they can have a swelling in the front of the uh, shoulder. So it's very important to have this as a differential diagnosis when patient presents to you with anterior shoulder pain and swelling. So indications, adhesive capsulitis and glenohumeral osteoarthritis. Now, how would you scan the shoulder? I prefer doing the post trade techniques. You put the ultrasound probe at the back of the shoulder, below the spine of the scapula. Once you put it below the spine of the scapula, this is what's gonna look for. Humeral head, you have a glenoid process. The triangular structure you see here is called as glenoid labrum. And this is a structure you don't want to injure. And then we have the infraspinatus muscle, and that's basically a tendon of infraspinatus muscle, which is situated inside the tendon. Once you move the ultrasound probe in the similar line laterally, then you look for a structure called as uh, suprascapular nerve and suprascapular artery, because you're now looking at the spinal glenoid notch. So you can still see the hyaline cartilage, you can still see the humerus, but you're moving laterally. So this is a picture you want to do the injection treatment. And how would you do the injection? You can bring the needle in plane, coming from lateral to medial, just showing you here, bringing the needle in plane. And you're going to stop here just before you are going to touch the labrum. So do not touch the labrum or injure the labrum. The way to know your injection is going in the right area is when you inject, the local anesthetic will spread medially. If the injection of a local anesthetic is collecting in the muscle, then you know you have not pierced the capsule. So it's very important to pierce the capsule and guide the injection medially. So this is what is just showing you. This is the labrum of the uh, glenoid uh, cavity. Now, suprascapular nerve block, another very effective injection treatment for sh chronic shoulder pain. You can also do this for patients for post-operative analgesia following a shoulder surgery. Uh, for patients who you don't think interscalene block is, is indicated or appropriate, because if they have a COPD, you want to avoid interscalene block, you can do suprascapular nerve block uh, as, as an alternative way of providing them the analgesia. How would you do this? You put the ultrasound probe on the spine of the scapula, you move up, and you're going to look for the suprascapular uh, trapezius muscle, supraspinatus muscle, and basically deep to the supraspinatus muscle is where your suprascapular nerve is located. You just bring the needle in, touch the bone, and you basically inject the local anesthetic and steroid, and it will bathe your suprascapular nerve. So this is how you would do, and same thing you would do with the uh, outer plane or in-plane technique for pulse radio frequency. The next structure that is of interest is the axillary nerve. This is the nerve that is now very commonly targeted by people for post-op analgesia, as well as for pulse radio frequency of the uh, uh, shoulder joint. Now, how would you look at this nerve? You put the ultrasound probe longitudinally at the back of the shoulder, looking for the humeral head and the sharp junction. You have two muscles to look at, the deltoid muscle and the teres minor muscle. Once you've seen these two muscles, you look for an artery, which is the posterior circumflex humeral artery shown here by a Doppler signal. And you put the needle just on the top of the artery and you will catch the axillary nerve because the nerve is accompanied by the artery. So updates of the shoulder joint. Now this is, we're talking about radio frequency of the articular branches to the shoulder. So there have been quite a lot of research recently. A lot of cadaver studies have come out uh, telling the shoulder joint is not just supplied by suprascapular nerve. You have axillary nerve. You have other nerves that are supplying to the shoulder joint. Every joint follows this law. It's called Hilton's law. Hilton's law states that the joints in the body are innervated by the nerve supplying across that joint. For example, if you talk about knee joint, knee joint has 
nerve to vastus medialis, nerve to vastus intermedius, nerve to vastus lateralis. So these are the muscles that are over the joint. You have vastus medialis muscle, you have vastus lateralis muscle, you have vastus intermedius. And all these nerves, they will supply to the muscle. And once they have given a distal branch, then the, the part of the nerve that's entering to the joint capsule is purely sensory. And that's why when you do the radio frequency of these joint, uh, these nerves, distally, you will not get any muscle weakness. Same things hold true for shoulder joint. So the branches of axillary, suprascapular, lateral pectoral, lower subscapular, when you target them close to the joint, you will not get any motor weakness. So innovation of the shoulder joint is nothing new. This was way back, like in 1945, described by an anatomist from Michigan called Ernest Gardner, who actually told about the, and then off comes a study five years ago uh, in regional anesthesia pain medicine, which was a cadaveric study on articular branches of shoulder joint by Max Ekman from United States. And then another study came from Toronto, uh, from Philip Peng and John Tran and Ann Arger uh, in 2019. Now, what's new in terms of the nerve supply to the shoulder joint? We only knew the suprascapular nerve, but now we know it's not just suprascapular nerve. You have axillary nerve, lateral pectoral nerve, and lower subscapular nerve. So axillary nerve, suprascapular nerve, they actually insert, uh, not insert, they basically supply the majority of the posterior portion of the joint. Lateral pectoral nerve supplies to the anterior part of the joint capsule. And you also have subscapular nerve, which also supplies to the anterior part of the joint capsule. So this is a four and a half minute video. Hopefully you will find this useful because it's telling you the anatomy of all these nerves and the rest of the presentation will be easy to understand. So I know it's a slightly lengthy video, but it will tell you how the nerves come out, where they go and where they supply. So I'm just gonna quickly skip few first few seconds of the video and then we will move on to the video. So I'm going to tell you the skeleton anatomy relevant for the conventional radio frequency and pulse radio frequency treatment for the shoulder joint. Now, in the past, we knew that the shoulder joint is supplied by suprascapular nerve, and the, the nerve distribution is about 70% of the shoulder joint is supplied by suprascapular nerve. The new cadaveric studies actually say it's not just a suprascapular nerve, there are so many other nerves that contribute to the shoulder joint's nerve supply. So the other nerves are lower subscapular, we've got lateral pectoral nerve, we've got axillary nerve. So these are the nerves that we also need to pay attention in order to perform a uh, good denervation of the shoulder joint. So let's start with the suprascapular nerve, and I'll tell you the skeleton anatomy and we'll live into that. So the suprascapular nerve starts from the superior trunk, and you know it follows the overhide muscle and enters in the through the suprascapular notch and enters into the suprascapular fossa. As soon as it enters the notch, the first thing it does is gives a branch to the acromial clavicular joint. Then it supplies to the supraspinatus muscle, and it's actually underneath the deep fascia of the supraspinatus muscle. Then it goes down through the spinal glenoid notch, and then supplies to the infraspinatus muscle. But before it goes down, it gives the branches to the the superior capsule of the glenohumeral joint. So this is one of the targets that is recommended now for the superior branches to the superior part of the capsule of suprascapular nerve and acromolar clavicular joint, where you can do a conventional radio frequency in this area by using the ultrasound and x-ray. So what I call the combined technique, combined ultrasound and fluoroscopy technique, is to get this area, so not in the spinal glenoid notch, not in the suprascapular notch, but at the superior part of the glenoid cavity, where you can bring the needle, you can park these two needles, you'll get the suprascapular nerve the superior, uh, superior branches to the capsule as well as the acromoglavular joint branches by performing the radio frequency in this particular area. Once the suprascapular nerve comes down the supra, uh, the spinal glenoid notch, then you have this particular area which you can scan using the ultrasound, and this will be the target. And if you use the ultrasound and if you park one needle here, one needle here, then this is the inferior branches to the capsule of the glenohumeral joint of suprascapular nerve. The other nerve that also contributes to this particular area is the posterior branches of the axillary nerve. So that's why I think this particular target will be useful to get both the suprascapular and axillary branches to the shoulder joint. The other target for the axillary nerve would be is the lower part of the greater tuberosity. So this is another target 
for the conventional radio frequency treatment for the uh, for, the, for the shoulder joint. In the past, we've done a pulse radio frequency treatment for the axillary nerve, and the way to target that would be putting the ultrasound probe like that, looking for pulsations of posterior circumflex humeral artery, and the nerve usually accompanies the artery. If you put the needle next to the artery, and if you do a pulse RF, you'll get a pulse RF of axillary nerve. Now, two new nerves, not two new, I would say, but these are the nerves that have been significantly contributing to the anterior shoulder joint supply. One of them is the lateral pectoral nerve, and the target for the lateral pectoral nerve is the outer quadrant of the coracoid process. So you can scan the coracoid process with the transverse view, scan in the longitudinal view, and go for the lower part by out-of-plane approach. You can target this area using the conventional radio frequency. And the last nerve that's currently under research and is kind of deeply located, the, the, these are the branches of the lower subscapula as well as the anterior branches of the axillary. So it's the anterior part of the glenoid uh, process where you have to target these using the X-rays and the ultrasound. So you could use ultrasound, put the needle, because it will prevent you from giving any pneumothorax, but then once you put the needle in this area, then you'll have to do the X-ray to make sure that you are actually targeting this particular skeletal uh, landmark to get the radio frequency treatment done for the anterior part of the capsule of the shoulder joint. Thank you. Okay, so that just gives you the whole idea about so now when it comes to denervating the shoulder joint, uh, you have to ask the patient where the pain is. If the patient says the pain is all over the shoulder, you will have to denervate all the nerves. If the patient says pain is majority of the times on the posterior part of the shoulder, you could denervate suprascapular nerve and axillary nerve and that would do the job. If the patient has an anterior shoulder pain, you will have to denervate lateral pectoral nerve and lower subscapular nerve. So this is why, and that this is the cadaveric study in the picture from the John Trang and Peng's paper that asked the patient where the pain is. So they've divided into four quadrants and based on how, where the pain is, you could target which nerve to denervate. Now they have also described a technique called midpoint technique. So I've showed you the skeletal anatomy. We have a a suprascapular fossa and you have a spinal glenoid notch and between the two if you park a needle and you can do conventional radio frequency the beauty of this is you will be basically getting some weakness of supraspinatus muscle but you will still preserve the infraspinatus muscle okay so this is the midpoint technique that you can do a conventional radio frequency treatment how would you look for this midpoint when you put the ultrasound probe looking for the suprascapular notch this is a picture you will see and when you move the probe slightly more far inferiorly you will see the spinal glenoid notch which is much more deeper between the two is your midpoint and this is what you could do as an alternative to other procedures that I'm going to show you with the fluoroscopy. So practical approach. So you want to denervate the shoulder joint. You need to look at the suprascapular nerve, axillary nerve, lateral pectoral, and lower subscapular. Now, these are the fluoroscopy targets. This is given from this paper from Max Ekman. So suprascapular articular branches. So make the patient lay prone. You use the x-ray. Look for the glenoid process. And you're basically putting the needle on the top that will give you the articular branches of suprascap and this so this paper actually doesn't talk about this particular target this is also very important as we saw on the skeletal anatomy this area has axillary nerve branches and suprascapular nerve branches so you need to denervate both the top and the bottom of the glenoid process then you have the greater tuberosity of the humerus, the base of the greater tuberosity is where you would get the axillary nerve. Uh, this is another target that has been suggested. Lateral pectoral, patient will be supine. You'll be basically screening the patient using the C-arm, looking for the coracoid process. And it's the outer and lateral aspect of the coracoid process is where you want to put the needle to do the radio frequency. Now you can see all these nerves and all these targets using ultrasound. So you don't always have to use x-rays. The reason you use x-rays is from medical legal point of view. If you're denervating somebody's joint, you need to save the images. So x-rays are useful to save the images. And this is a good paper from a good friend of mine, Agi Stogica from, uh, from uh, Budapest. 
uh, Hungary. She actually wrote a paper with Philip Peng on cryoanalgesia for shoulder. The treatment stays the same. Radio frequency of cryo, the target stays the same. So what they've done, this is a target one, putting the ultrasound probe, looking for the top of the glenoid process, and then moving the probe down, looking for the bottom of the glenoid process. And you can bring the needle in plane, trying to get both top and the bottom. So just showing you the picture here, bringing the needle in, and you can denervate the posterior branches of suprascapular nerve and axillary nerve. Now, they are, this is the picture showing you the uh, lower subscapular nerve. Uh, so I showed you this is the nerve, which is much more deeper, much more challenging. And this is the, uh, uh, so the, the uh, lateral pectoral nerve branches, looking at the coracoid process and bringing the needle in plane. So all of these nerves can be very accurately targeted using the uh, ultrasound. And this is the x-ray showing fine tuning of the needle. So once you park your needle for lower subscapular, you do the x-ray just to save the image, or if the needle is too more medial, you need to target it a bit lateral. So we are going to cover all these procedures, hip, knee, shoulder. Uh, if you like visiting Dubai, do come and join me on 21st and 22nd of October. We're going to cover this on the ultrasound simulators, hands-on live demo, uh, including regenerative medicine like PRP, uh, spine denervation. So a lot of the program is packed. It's on 21st and 22nd of October. There's a QR code there and you can go to the bookcpd.com and you can register for the course. Now, moving on to the elbow. So we've covered all the shoulder procedures. Moving on to the elbow, elbow ultrasound guided injections, you will be covering lateral epicondyle, medial epicondyle. I've basically decided not to cover the median nerve or ulnar nerve because these nerves are done uh, uh, ultrasound guided blocks for regional anesthesia anyway. So lateral epicondyle or what we call as tennis elbow. So ask the patient to basically, when you examine, you do the pronation. When the patient has pain on pronation on the lateral aspect, it's usually a tennis elbow. If the patient has pain on the medial aspect on supination, then it's the uh, golfer's elbow. Now, it's the common extensor and common flexor origin is what you're interested in. And this is just showing you. So tennis elbow is a tendinosis or tendinitis of common extensor origin. It's a repetitive microtrauma. So if you want to treat these patients, you need to ask them what particular movements they're performing. Okay, why it's called tennis elbow? It's very common in tennis player because tennis players hold the racket and ram it that way. So they basically do a lot of pronation and micro trauma, repetitive overuse is what's causing the problem. You look for the ultrasound picture, normal ultrasound picture, you'll have uniform fibrillar pattern. It's all nice and uniform. You know, you have superficial fibers of, of extensor digitorum and you have deep fibers of extensor carpi radialis brevis, okay? So this is very important. You need to look for the nice uniform pattern. If you have tendinitis or tendinosis, you will have tendon thickening, outward bowing, hypoechogenicity, or you will have increased Doppler. So this is a normal image. This is an abnormal image. Look at the nice fibrillar pattern here. You have a hypoechoic area. There's an outbowing of the, of the fibers of the extensor uh, carpi radialis. Uh, so you have to basically look at this. Now look here, you have thickening and hypoechoic area. So it's very important to con co you know, find out. If patient has a unilateral problem, always scan the opposite side it will help you to compare. Always compare the contralateral side in order to help you diagnose the condition. So this is just going you, showing you a schematic diagram. This is the common extensor origin and you have the radial collateral ligament. This is a radial head, that's the elbow joint entrance and your area of interest is this area here. This is where you will bring the needle. How do you perform this procedure? You can perform this in sitting position or you can perform the pa patient in supine with arm on the arm bone. And I prefer doing this with patients supine because majority of these patients are young and they probably get vasovagal. So it's better to have them supine and you can have the arm on the arm table and do the procedure using in-plane technique shown by this. What are the injectates? 40 milligrams of depot, one ml of one person lidocaine, uh, you can inject PRP, three mLs of PRP is 
is fine. You can do prolotherapy as well. If PRP is not available, you can use five or 10% dextrose, three to four MLs, and that works well. Similar to lateral lipicondyl, you have medial lipicondylitis. The condition is very much similar. It's called golfer's elbow. The ultrasound findings are also very much similar. You will find thick heterogeneous focal, focal, focal hypoechoic area. Look at this. This is not uniform or fibrillar. A lot of irregularity and hypoechogenicity is here. The and then you can see here, if you put a Doppler, you will see neovascularization, increased Doppler take. You can see the calcification here as well. So if you see any of these changes, when you scan the patient with medial or lateral epicondyle pain, you know they have a tendinosis. And one of the treatments is either a steroid injection or a platelet-rich plasma. Now, medial epicondyle injection, this is the picture you're looking for. This is the common flexor origin. This is the ulnar collateral ligament. This is a trapezoid process, and you have an elbow joint entrance, and your target will be below this area. If you do a superficial injection of steroids, it does work. Unfortunately, steroid can cause subcutaneous fat atrophy, so it's better to go deep and inject below the, the common flexor origin. And this is what you're showing you. You can do this, as I said, in sitting position, or you can do it with the patient's arm behind the head. That's another position that has been described. And as I said, I prefer doing all the elbow procedures supine with the arm on the arm board. And you can do it in, in plain technique. So just showing you the needle. So this is a needle position for the local anesthetic and steroid. If you're doing a platelet-rich plasma, I will do multiple dry needling and followed by that inject the PRP in the substance of the muscle. So that's why it's important to know where to locate the needle. For steroids, go deep. For uh, uh, PRP, go into the substance of the muscle. I'm just showing you another picture with the in-plane technique going below the common flexor origin. The, the injectate, the needle size, everything stays the same as we did for lateral epigondal. Moving on to the last part now, wrist and hand. So carpal tunnel. Now, there are a lot of people who have been doing nerve conduction studies, and there is a, a quite a lot of evidence coming out that if the patient has symptoms of carpal tunnel, and if you use an ultrasound, and if the ultrasound shows the cross-sectional area of median nerve more than 13 millimeter, that is Bando carpal tunnel. So there's no doubt. And the treatment will be injection of local anesthetic and steroid and do hydrolyzed section. If the patient has a, a median nerve cross-sectional area less than 10 millimeter, it's less likely they have a carpal tunnel, okay? So it's very useful to use ultrasound to diagnose the condition instead of doing nerve conduction studies. A lot of people are now moving away from nerve conduction studies and they're doing carpal tunnel injections as a treatment to diagnose as well as treat. So this is just showing you a picture here. The black band you see here is the uh, retinaculum, okay? It's a flexor retinaculum, and you want to see the nerve below the flexor retinaculum. This is a pisiform bone, and what we're going to do is showing you the difference. So we're moving on to the uh, carpal tunnel scanning, longitudinal view, and carpal tunnel scanning in the uh, uh, transverse view. Transverse view, you can see the median nerve here, and you can see the median nerve in the longitudinal scan. Now, how do you differentiate? Look at the normal side and the carpal tunnel side. So no, the carpal tunnel side, you can see the nerve being swollen. If you do a longitudinal scan, you will see the nerve be becoming really, really big as compared to normal side, which is a normal cross-sectional area on the, on, the, on the transfer scanning. So the carpal tunnel injection, now how would you do it? This is another schematic diagram showing you how to actually look at the carpal, uh, the median nerve in the carpal tunnel. You have the dotted line, which is the flexor retinaculum. You have superficial and deep flexors of the, ten, of the, of the forearm. You have flexor pollicis longus tendon. Ask the patient to move the thumb. If they move the thumb, usually the median nerve is on the medial side. This is the ulnar artery, medial side to the flexor pollicis longus tendon. So ask the patient to move the thumb and then you can scan the nerve up and down proximally to distally 
and you will be able to locate the nerve and you want to do the injection below the flexor retinaculum. Usually there is an adhesion between the nerve and the flexor retinaculum and that's where the compression is. That's where it's called as compression, compression neuropathy because or entrapment neuropathy. So you want to hydrodissect the nerve, free it off from the flexor retinaculum above and below from the superficial flexors in order for the nerve to be freed off. And you will find that the symptoms of the patient improve with hydrodissection and local anesthetic and steroid is what's commonly used. You can also use 5% dextrose or 10% dextrose. Moving on to the last part, the trigger finger. We're going now onto the finger point. So this is the release of A1 pulley. Ask the patient to open and close you. It's, it's very kind of, you know, a classic thing that the patient will say, when I try to open my finger, suddenly it just opens up or sometimes I'm struggling to open, but once it's open, it doesn't close. So it's an A1 pulley that's blocking the tendon movement. And so there are pulleys, as you would say, A1 pulley is located here at the head of the metacarpal. Then you have A2 pulley. This is like only two pulleys when you're talking about the thumb. When you talk about the fingers, then you have more than one pulley. You have A1 pulley, A2 pulley, A3 pulley, A4 pulley, A5 pulley. The five pulleys. Majority of the times you'll find the pulley problem is the A1 pulley. That's where the tendon is compressed and you want to hydrodissect the pulley so that the tendon starts to move freely. How do we do this? You can use a hockey stick probe or you can use a linear probe. A hockey stick probe is advantageous because the footprint is small. You can do an in-plane technique, you can do an out-of-plane technique, and I'll show you the video. Needle, I use the needle that they use for Botox, 27 gauge needle. Local anesthetic, very small dose, one ml would be good enough. You can inject the steroids, PRP, hyaluronic acid. People have been using growth factors. In my practice, I would use local anesthetic and steroid as a way to help to resolve this condition. So this is the uh, uh, metacarpal head and you're going to put the ultrasound probe on the top of the metacarpal head and you will be looking for the pulley, which is a hypoechoic area. This is a tendon uh, of the uh, uh, finger. So you have uh, the A1 pulley here. You can come in out of plane or you can come in in plane. So this is a transfer scan showing you, you can put the ultrasound probe transversely on the metacarpal head looking for the tendon. This is the tendon. Of, uh, and then you have a hypoechoic area, which is a ring, which is the A1 pulley. And you want to inject into the pulley, not in the tendon. And as I said, it will be difficult for you to inject in the tendon. Now, how would you do? This is a hockey stick probe showing you in plain technique, bringing the needle in and trying to hydrodissect the pulley. So this is what we would do. And this is a video showing you in plain technique, needle coming in, and this you are entering into the A1 pulley and you will basically hydro dissect out. This is just on the loop, but this is what we did, bringing the needle in plane and basically hydro dissecting the A1 pulley. Last bit is the unlearned nerve in Guyon's canal. And it, this is another uh, a very useful uh, injection treatment for patients who complain of pain in the medial one and a half fingers. So you, you, they wouldn't have any problems with the elbow. The nerve compression is in the Guyon's canal. They might have a rheumatoid arthritis. They might have had a previous trauma. It's very useful to do the scanning and you can actually look at the Guyon's canal. The Guyon's canal at the, at the level of pisiform bone. So it's very important to look at the pisiform bone, the artery, and you will have the ulnar nerve in the Guyon's canal. Once you move to position B, the canal ends, the nerve and the artery are basically outside the canal. The compression neuropathy is usually taking place in the Guyon's canal. So this is where you would do an in-plane technique, bring the needle in, it's showing you doing the injection of the Guyon's canal, trying to free off or hydrodissect the ulnar nerve in order to minimize the uh, symptoms in the medial uh, one and a half fingers or little finger and the uh, middle finger. So that's it. I think, guys, uh, deep variance. Yeah, that's another condition in terms of the wrist. So patients with Finkelstein sign. So what is Finkelstein sign? You ask the patient to put the thumb inside and make a fist and ask them to do the flexion. If they complain of pain 
on the first extensor compartment, that's the decreased stenosynovitis. Uh, the condition can be easily diagnosed. If you put the ultrasound probe, you will see a lot of fluid around the these tendons, the first uh, extensor tendons, extensor pollicis brevis, and abductor pollicis longus (APL, EPB). And you basically want to bring the needle. You can bring the needle out of plane, or you can bring in in plane. I prefer in plane. It's a very superficial structure. Bring the needle in plane and put one to two mLs of local anesthetic and steroid. So that's all we've covered the majority of the ultrasound guided MSK injection starting all the way from the shoulder all the way down to the finger. So if you guys want to connect with me, I'm available on LinkedIn. Uh, it's my LinkedIn profile, Sadiq Bayani. Uh, I'm also on Facebook. Uh, it's Sadiq Bayani as well on the Facebook and on Twitter. You can send me a friend's request or connect with me at Bayani Sadiq on Twitter. So thank you so much, guys. I hope you guys found this helpful. I'm just going to stop the screen share and we will also uh, take the question answers now. That was very good, Sadiq. I would just call it not, um, I mean, I mean, it was more of a master class on the complete upper limb blocks starting from Absolutely. shoulder till uh, the later part. Um, we have only one question till now. Sure. I mean, but you answered it before earlier. What solution do you inject? And what is the doses and concentrations? What solution to inject where? Uh, for which block? The question is what solution do you inject? Doses and concentration. Okay, well, solution yeah. wise, the majority of the MSK injections, I prefer to inject 1% lidocaine for all the joints. Lidocaine is a less chondrotoxic local anesthetic as compared to uh, uh, bupivacaine. Bupivacaine is very chondrotoxic, okay? So it's very important to keep that in mind. Your steroids are also chondrotoxic, but if you compare the local anesthetic, 0.5% bupivacaine is way chondrotoxic. It kills the cartilages as compared to 1% lidocaine. Ropivacaine is the least chondrotoxic. It's much better to use ropivacaine, but ropivacaine is expensive. So we prefer using lidocaine, and Depomedrone or Canalog, your choice. I prefer using Depomedrone, uh, but those are my kind of volume wise, majority of the small joints won't need more than two mLs uh, of local anesthetic. Shoulder joint is a medium sized joint. You can inject five mLs. In joints like hip joint is a bigger joint, you need 10 mLs of local anesthetic. So you have to decide which joint you are injecting. Uh, and then based on that, you can decide your volume. Uh, and as I said, the mixture is 1% lidocaine by default with either Depomedrone or Canalog. Thank you, Sally. So, I mean, if I would like to add on that, I mean, uh, we've been injecting inside the joints, but uh, off late uh, since uh, ultrasound and direct uh, guided injections I've been doing for musculoskeletal, let's say, uh, trigger point injections or, uh, um, I mean, uh, intramuscular facial plane blocks. What I have noticed is when I do Ropivacaine, the yeah. patients say that, Earlier, the, the, I mean, the last injection with BPVK used to hurt much more than what ROPVK right. hurts. And uh, the burning is less and uh, the duration of pain relief seems to be less. We don't have a massive data about that, but yes, that's my clinical practice and observation. So yeah. I definitely agree with you with, regarding ROPVK. Um, then we have this next question uh, by Mr. Saeed. Which technique do you prefer hydro, for hydro dissection of median nerve? Uh, that's in carpal tunnel, in, in, plane. in plane or in out plane. of plane? In plane. It's very useful to do an in-plane technique because you really want to see the needle going above, going below the nerve, and you want to really try and free off the nerve. And there are a lot of studies coming out. Actually, it's a compressive neuropathy or entrapment neuropathy. And if you do hydrodissection using 5% dextrose or 10% dextrose, it's way good enough. You don't need to put steroids. Okay, If you free off the nerve, the reason they have neuropathic pain because the nerve is compressed in the carpal tunnel because of the flexor retinaculum or previous surgery, the scar formation has happened. And now the scar is putting pressure on the nerve, reducing the blood supply to the nerve, leading to the neuropathic symptoms. So you could actually use just 5% or 10% dextrose, but it's very important to use ultrasound and you need to go up and down just to free off the nerve. And then also do a longitudinal scan to see how the nerve is bathed in the local anesthetic or your dextrose. And that will be giving you much better results. 
rather than out of plane with you know out of plane i agree i'm, I'm completely an in plane guy i mean I'm, i think maybe the ijv insertion is the only thing i do in plane but out of plane otherwise everything is in plane what i've started doing now is i do out of in plane always but in cross sectional so yes. you do short, short axis view in plane and then once you have hydro dissected i started doing long axis in plane also just just to make sure that the um, hydro dissection goes longitudinally along the path of the median uh, more distally but yes i agree with you it's more about uh, long i mean um, in plane view in plane technique yeah, one yeah. more question here do you yeah. usually have any coadjuvant or adjuvant to the lidocaine uh, lidocaine and the depomedrone depends on what condition you are using this for but i think majority of time as i said i would be using the depomedrone uh, and lidocaine uh, as a way. Uh, if you are using PRP, then obviously we don't use any local anesthetic. Local anesthetic is only for the skin. PRP, if you mix it with local anesthetic, the effect of the PRP will be kind of you know gone. So you really don't want to use. But yeah, lidocaine plus depomedrone is the is a combination on an average everywhere. So that's, um, that's no more questions that. here. Yep. I uh, think we're good. Uh, somebody asked. I think you're good. Yes, you covered almost an hour of uh, teaching here, and that's that's a lot of time for a lot of people on a Saturday evening. <laughs> Absolutely, thank I'm you so sure. much. It was really, really good. Yeah. No, I really appreciate you guys uh, tuning in. We will announce the next session, which will be the lower limb MSK. That will happen sometime in August. Uh, so as I say, do join us. Uh, in Dubai and in Prague, if you're interested in the MSK uh, procedures. Uh, as I said, I've been doing MSK, uh, ultrasound guided MSK interventions for good about nine to 10 years now. And uh, joint innovation has been my area of interest. So, you know, I've been using uh, radio frequency treatment, cryotherapy, and all of that we will be covering in Dubai as well as in Prague. So, thank you so much. Have a good weekend. And we will catch up again uh, in next few weeks on another Pain Talks season four episode. Thanks very much, Amit, for moderating. Thanks, Alec. Really Thank you everyone for joining. Bye bye now, guys. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.